Today is May the 24th, 2014. We are in Zapata, Texas. Um, yes, we're in Zapata, Texas at the airport. Okay, interviewing Renato Ramirez for the Voices Oral History Project. My name is Maggie Rivas Rodriguez, and thank you, Mr. Ramirez, for agreeing to the interview today. So, here are my questions. And at the end, I'm going to ask you to, to sign this form so okay. we can have this as part of the record. We'll go over that when we're done. Though. Um, okay, so what is the, um, your date of birth? January 6, 1940. And where were you born? I was born in Old Zapata, which today is underwater on Lake Falcon. Uh, Old Zapata was in existence probably for right at 200 years. And uh, in 1944, the U.S. and Mexico entered into a treaty to dam up the Rio Grande River for water conservation and flood uh, protection. And so um, the uh, governments of Mexico and the United States took about 100,000 acres from area landowners, uh -huh. condemned them, and, and, uh, and then uh, built the dam about 30 miles from the old town site of Zapata down the river. And in 1953, that uh, lake got full and our, our town went underwater. And so we now live in the new town of Zapata, which is four miles east of the old town, up in the hills. And I know you are a veteran, right? Yes, 1961 to 1963. Um, what languages did you speak growing up? Uh, well, in, in Old Zapata, we had no Anglos. Actually, we had two Anglos, Mr. Ed Morrow, and maybe three Anglos, Mr. Ed Morrow, Mr. Cunningham, who was the customs uh, agent at the bridge, and Ms. Walker. And that's, the rest of us were all Mexicanos, and we, we spoke Spanish. We had no blacks. So did you speak any English at all growing yeah, up? Yeah, not growing up, no. Uh, my parent, my father had a second grade education and my mother had a, a third or fourth grade education, but in Mexico. Mm -hmm. in, at that time, Guerrero, Mexico, and Zapata were sister cities on a bridge, on a river that maybe spanned a uh, hundred yards. And so uh, there was a free flow of people from Mexico to the U.S. And so my mother, my mother had a fifth or sixth grade education okay. and did not speak it. Neither one of them spoke good English. They kind of could get understood, but, yeah. but they did not speak English. Okay. So I know that you have um, an MBA uh, yes. from UT Austin. And, uh, and I, I picked up some of this from, your, um, from all the paperwork yeah. that I got. So what was your elementary school? What is the name of your elementary school? Uh, we didn't have names back then. There were World War II bar bar uh, barracks that came, uh, you know, when the war ended. They went, they had a big auction in San Antonio at the uh, Lackland Air Force Base or one of those bases and bought a bunch of frame, frame, uh, just, just frame buildings and brought them down. And so there was no, there was, back then there was no names for schools. Was that in the past? Yes. Okay. You, okay. Great. Just pin this up there. Okay. So, um, so was this in Zapata, your yes, elementary school? In old Zapata, right. And okay. so, and my teachers were basically family members. Uh, my my uh, first uh, four years, uh, Esperanza Martinez, who was uh, my dad's first cousin, was my teacher, and then it was uh, Pepa Gutierrez, uh, Pepa Martinez Gutierrez. Again, related, uh, so it was more of a family affair in school. So, uh, how many kids were in your classroom then? In the cl in the classroom, maybe fifteen, twenty, and, and the total school, including seniors, a uh, hundred. Graduated two or three seniors a year. The school was not accredited. So, when you graduated from high school, you had to go take 
test to be allowed to be out of, you know, to be able to enter college. Well, because they were not accredited schools. So you went through those schools all the way through to high well, no, school? No, no, no. I, in 1952, I was 12 years old, uh, 53. Uh, we moved to Laredo when, uh, when the town was inundated. And uh, I went to L.J. Christen Junior High School for 8th and ninth grade, and then to Martin High School for 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And I graduated from Martin High School in 1957. Okay. And so then from there, from Arden High School, then you went to Texas A&M. A &M. Why Just, Texas A&M? Uh, well, you know, put it in perspective. My parents were had not even junior high school, and so you said, where are you going? You know, I'm going to A&M. I, I don't know why. Uh, again, you got to remember, in those days, the universities in Texas were Lubbock, Fort Worth, Dallas, Waco, Austin, College Station, Houston. If you wanted to get a college degree, that's where you're going to have to go. Was there not Texas A&I? Well, so? yes, Texas, there was a Texas A&I, uh, but it was, there was Texas College of Arts and Industries that was limited to being a school teacher. That was not my calling. Okay. So basically, Texas A&M then, just because it was like, the few, one of the few that you knew anything yeah, well, about, yeah. and did, people must have said good things about it, though. Yeah, and it was a, it was a, probably more in tune for a small town boy than the University of Texas. Okay. Um, so, let me just fill these things out. So, what year did you graduate from Texas A and M? Nineteen sixty one. Okay. So tell me all the jobs that you've held before you went into the military. Okay. Well, for years, you know, growing up, my dad uh, one of, was the first mechanic in Zapata. You know, you got to remember, that's about the time that when my dad was, was in his 20s, that's about the time that Ford invented the car. And, and so my dad became a mechanic and a, and a damn good mechanic. And a welder, and so we had a service station. How many cars were there? Not many, but we had a service station. We did, you know, we learned early in life the changing spark plugs. Back then, you know, spark plugs had to be changed out every three thousand miles or eighteen thousand miles, however, however many miles, and and change the air filter, change the oil and oil filter, and and those kinds of things. And so we le we learned to work from age, you know, very little. Uh, there in Old Zapata, our service station was uh, on, on the main U.S. Highway 83, but it was next door to the local beer joint, a uh, place called Frenchie's. And so I've always been kind of resourceful, so I got me a little shoe shine box and started shining shoes when I was in, when, when there was no business at the service station to walk across into the beer joint and shine shoes for drunks. <laughs> How much did you get from that? Uh, well, it was about, a, it was a nickel a pair. <laughs> so about but how? That was in 52, a nickel was a lot of money. So how much would you make like in a day? Uh, what would you dollar, consider a good day? A dollar, a dollar, but back then it was a lot of money. So when you started with your dad's service station, how old were you when you started that? Oh, well, since little kids, five, six years old, but, but, but not really get to where you were expected to do work and maybe 10, 11. You know, you're expected, hey, you're going to go fill up that car with gas and collect, make change, and all that kind of stuff. What is the name of your dad's service station? Uh, don't, I don't recall. I guess it's the Abel Ramirez uh, service station. Abel Ramirez Conoco, as a matter of fact. Okay, so so after that, um, what did you? Were, were there other jobs that you did before went until? Well, I mean, very early in life, my my grandfather was a farmer, and, and he planted onions and cantaloupe and watermelon and tomatoes and that kind of stuff, and so we learned how to pick tomatoes and pick cotton and all that kind of stuff. So we we were farm workers. 
and, and you know, part of that was ranching, and so I learned how to ride and rope very early in life. You know, I, I remember as a 12-year-old roping, roping animals, in, 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 not in the brush, but in, in the pen when we were earmarking, branding, and that kind of stuff. So, so we learned early in life that you got to, you know, you're going to have to work. So you were picking, um, picking cantaloupes and onions and things, mm -hmm. and, but you were also working with the horses and the yeah. cattle. Okay. Um, anything else? Uh, well, it, it, you know, if you, we did that throughout our, our young career. When, when I, we moved to Laredo, then we distanced ourselves from the farm. And so in Laredo, I worked for a tire shop, and my job was just, uh, they'd go to salvage and buy a bunch of used tubes, and we would patch them and fix them up, and we would, you know, um, so I, wor I worked in a tar shop, just just airing up inner tubes and see where the leaks are, put patches on them, wrap them up, you know, identify them by size, 6, 7 by 15 or 7, 10 by 16 or whatever the number was, and we'd put them on there. And, and so that was my job, and I got a dollar a day for that. And then I moved to um, uh, Santos Tire Shop. But there was more of tire, new tire sales, and and bringing in a car, take off the four tires, take them, take the tires off, and put new tires on, balance them, put them back on, and so on. And that was a little bit better. I got twenty dollars <laughs> a day. And, uh, no, no, a week. Oh. twenty dollars a week. Uh, and and so when I was working at Santos, there's a guy came in, a fellow named George Mapus, Mapus Construction, and he liked. The fact that I've always been aggressive, and he says, uh, "I want you to come to work for me." And I said, "And in construction?" I said, "Okay." He says, and "I'm gonna I'm gonna pay you a dollar and a quarter an hour, which was the minimum wage then." And I said, mm, 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 "That's fifty dollars a week." I said, "Yeah, you know, it's huge. It's a huge." I said, "Yes, let's go." And so uh, the only thing is that was a lot more physical, and which was good. I mean. He put me on the wrong end of a wheelbarrow, and they kept filling it up with concrete, and I'd go down there and dump it and come back, fill it up again, and dump it. So I did that every day, eight, ten hours a day, you know. And, and so, but when you're 16, 17 years old, yeah, you got resilience. And, and so that ended up having some huge impact down the road because I graduated from high school. I, I turned 16, 17 on January 6, 1957, and I graduated in May. So I was, even through the football season, I was 16 years old. And so, go back, when I was a freshman, I was 12. Can a 12-year-old kid take a 19-year-old in football? No. And so by the time you get to be 16, you say, nah, I think I can. I say, well, you you missed out on four years of coaching, so you're not you know you're you're just not going to develop in, in in the athletic area. So that that that's uh, came with the fact that we were focused on education and you're going to stay in school and you're going to stay in school. And so uh, I graduated you know at 17 and and I was 110 pounder or something like that. Well. You know what happens to kids when they get 17, 18, 19, then they all of a sudden they explode. And, and, and so when I got to A&M, I was already in the process. I was up to 137. And, and uh, so signed up for, for, for courses and went out through the registration process and got the, you have mandatory physical education. And so I said, yeah, I'll take table tennis or maybe bowling or something like that. And the guy said, there's two choices, boxing and wrestling. And I said, well, boxing hurts. <laughs> I said, so I wrestle. Well, I, you know, I came from a summer of the wheelbarrow. I had fantastic upper strength, upper body strength. I mean, I, they, they'd put those those. Uh, inch and a half ropes and to climb them. I'd go back up and down, up and down, up and down. And, and there's a trick to it too. I mean, there's not so much. I mean, I was in tremendous condition. I had tremendous upper body strength. 
But also there's a trick when you're climbing a rope. What's that? Take short bites. You start doing this, it you know you're pulling up for your weight. You you're pulling for a long long distance and and the leverage is not there. Right here you got the leverage. So but anyway, I could go up and down that rope and so the coach the the instructor of the wrestling class said, uh, I want you to try out for the wrestling team. I says, I've never been an athlete. Try out. So I went and I remember, you know, he had taken a few classes of holes and how to take somebody down and that kind of stuff. And so I got it to try out. He says, okay, I want you to wrestle that kid. He's a 110-pounder, you know, the flyweight or whatever. I said, man, no problem, boom. And 117, 127, 137, 147. And, and all of them, I took them down, and one after the other, one after the other. But I had conditioning. I mean, I'd been, <laughs> been with that wheelbarrow. And so when I got to that 167, you know, he really whipped me. <laughs> and, but he, you know, he was, it, but I was about 137 against 167 and tremendous difference in the strength. And, and so, but the coach said it did real, it did real well. Down the road, he made me wrestle a guy that weighed 267. And, but by then, I had developed a, a lot of the techniques and so on. And I said, you're not going to head a hold of me. <laughs> and I'd fake him, I'd fake him, I'd fake him. I'd, 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 and, and so finally, he got exasperated and committed, and I just grabbed his hand and took him down, and he fell like a turtle upside down, and I was on him. And, and I said, you're not getting up. And I beat him. I pinned him. I pinned him because he was he just like just like an upside down turtle, you know. You you got all the strength in the world, but you're upside down. You can't can't do anything. Uh, and so so you know, I had a good time and, and ended up in the 1960. I, I at the Southwest Conference uh, wrestling tournament. I got to the finals. I got beat in the finals, but but you know, I gave a good accounting of myself. And so, but but that came from the George Mapus wheelbarrow thing. <laughs> Okay, so that, that first uh, place where you were putting the air on in the inner, t inner mm -hmm. tubes, what was the name of that company? Santos Tire Shop. No, there was another one before that. Oh, that, Mars Pond Furniture. Como? Mars, M-A-R-S, Pond Furniture. P-A-L-M? P-A-W-M, Pond. Oh. They had a pond shop up front and a tire shop in the back. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and so then you went to, what's the name, Maples? What is it? No, Maples, M-A-P-U-S, Maples uh, Construction. Okay. So did you work at Maples Construction all through college? No, no, no. I, it was, those were summer, summer jobs. I had a couple, of, a couple of summers that I spent with Border Construction Company. And, and again, tied back to the, to the conditioning, I was what is, was called in the trade then a stake runner. And, and basically, when you're laying out a new road and you're trying to give it the finishing touch to the Kalisha base, the engineers go and put in blue tops, which is the level that they want the, 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 the ground. And on the side, they'll have another stake mark where the blue top is because you can't see it. And so stake runner's job is and then and those those blue tops about every 50 feet or every 50 yards. I'm not, I don't recall if it feet or yards, but it's whatever it was. And so the 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 stake runner's job is you pull out the stake marking it, and you indicate to the operator how much she needs to cut or add to the to the grade there. And as soon as the blade passes, you hammer it in and you take off running to the next stake. And you do that at eight hours a day. <laughs> eight hours a day. These little 50-yard 50, 50 uh, sprints. Eight hours a day. Boom, 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 boom. And so, you know, I get back to a and You know, just somebody want to wrestle them. Boom. <laughs> but it was always in very cool weather too, right? So you didn't have to worry about yeah, the like heat. Yeah, like 110 degrees <laughs> in the summer. <laughs> and, and so, and, and an interesting story in one of those jobs, uh, you know, the, the guys who had the contact and obviously Rene Ramirez, the All-American from University of Texas in 1960, uh, was working for the state. Part of the thing, again, and, you know, you're University of Texas star. 
And he just sat there and counted trucks. You know, so many trucks of Kalicha came through. She sat all the time. And, 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 and I was a nobody, so I, <laughs> I ran. And, and so uh, I remember when Renee said, at lunch, we'd, we'd take our little pail, a uh, little box lunch, and, and uh, we'd gather around a, a tractor who'd give us some shade for lunch. And, and Renee said, you know, there's real wrestlers, you know, I don't think they're all they're drummed up to be. And I said, well, anytime you want to try it. I said, ah, you're, you're, you're a very fast guy. You got speed, and I don't have that. So he said, well, let's try it. I said, okay. So <laughs> at, for lunch, for break, <laughs> running all day. And so the, we started wrestling. Well, if you don't know anything about wrestling, you're going down. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it is. And so, boom, boom, he, he's down. I said, you're not getting up now. <laughs> and and he still, today, he still remembers the day he challenged me. <laughs> and the guy just, boom. So, uh, I guess um, what's coming across is, I always had a good time. We were poor, we had to work hard, and, you know, eat lunches, eat, eat a taco or two for lunch, and... Yeah, but but we had a good time. We, we didn't know we were poor. <laughs> so after you, so you worked Mapus and then border construction. Were there any other jobs before before you went into the military? No, well, not till I graduated from college. Okay, okay. So uh, so you graduated from college in sixty one. Sixty one, and then you went into the military in sixty one. The military. Yeah. Okay, so you went straight from from. No, I had a I had a three month break, and I was a derrickman on. The, oil field in an offshore off of uh, Louisiana. What is a derrickman? The guy up at the top of the derrick. Uh, you know, what you, when, you're, when you're going in a hole, you have these 100 foot strings of pipe. You have some what, what are called elevators. And so they're coming up and you've taken the pipe off the side. I'll, I guess I need to back up a little bit the bit at the end that's cutting, it wears out. You know, 36 hours, uh, 72 hours, you have to come out and put a new bit because it's already wore out as it's cutting down there. And so you'd come out unscrewing the links 100 feet and you stack them on the side. And, and then as you're going in, you grab it, and here come the elevators, and at the, just the right time, you let go, grab the ears, and close it, picks it up. There's a guy down there that grabs a pipe with his shoulder. He's called a stabber, and he stabs it inside the other pipe, and then they, they screw it on, tighten it up, pick it up, and go back down, and then you redo that. So that's, that's what I, I did offshore. And, and offshore Louisiana. Which part did you do? I was up at the top, Derek. Oh, okay. That sounds kind of dangerous. No, you're, you, you've got harnesses and all kinds of... Yeah, it, the oil field is dangerous. I mean, there's no doubt about that. The oil field is dangerous. But, but uh, you had harnesses and... and, uh, you know, and I guess, in retrospect, there was almost no training for emergencies. You know? So if there was an emergency, who knows what you're going to do. Right. Okay, and we'll go into your military after uh, a little bit. But um, so you get back from military in '63, right? And so, where, what do you, what kind of job do you do? Then? I went to work for Reynolds Aluminum in uh, Corpus Christi in their alumina plant. Uh, and if you're familiar with the manufacture of uh, aluminum, mm -hmm. you get these uh, sands from the Caribbean uh, called bauxite. You bring it in, you put it into vats of caustic soda to dissolve the aluminum, and then you take the dirt that comes out and you pump it out to dry into drying beds, and you get it at a high temperature so that the aluminum it becomes uh, dissolved in like kind of sugar in tea, where you can't see it, but it's in there. And, and so at high temperature, you get that to be what is called a super saturated solution of aluminum oxide and and then it goes to a settling tank where you inter, you let it cool down and then you introduce a seed and then the aluminum just comes out of the solution 
and you get it out of the bo out of, out of, at the bottom, you start uh, tapping it into kilns to dry them. And then eventually they go to the smelting plant where you fill uh, vats with aluminum oxide and you put electric power to it to melt and melt and burn off the oxygen so it becomes aluminum oxide becomes ingot aluminum so that's what i my job there as some i was a mechanical engineer my job there was uh i was responsible for the pumps it was about 400 500 pumps uh that that i was responsible for in terms of the maintenance and, and there were some challenging issues there with corrosive box, I mean, caustic soda. Uh, and, and so you had to, to provide some, some ingenious or some, you know, you had to be resourceful to how do, how do I protect the bearings? You know, how do, and so, so we developed, um, yeah, I was at the head of developing a uh, pressurized oil mist that you would put into every bearing and so continuously, you had air pressure pushing out, so that meant that caustic soda could not come in. And then you had a little bit of an oil mist to have the lubrication. And, and so from the time I joined Reynolds, and I was the first mechanical engineer they hired, and within six, eight months, the life of the bearings on a pump went from about a month to two months, went to about two years. And so it was a tremendous cost savings for them. I mean, tremendous cost savings. And we had centrifugal pumps and we had uh, plunger pumps and, uh, you know, so, so that's what I did. But, but it just it was, it really wasn't my calling. I mean, I'm a people person and, and just sitting there with machines day in, day out. And, 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 and I might add also that for me it was extremely challenging because that's the first time I ever worked in a, in a union shop. And I'm a hands-on kind of guy. You know, I'm going to be the guy roping. I'm going to be the guy riding the horse. I'm going to be the guy doing things. And there, your management, do that, you know, and hey, do that. You're trying to experiment with something, but I could not get my hands on the machine. And that's frustrating. I can't get my hands on the machine. I got to tell this union guy to go and tighten up a little bit more. And I don't know if he tightened up enough. Because I got, I want to feel it, and and, and you know, it just it, that was extremely frustrating for me to work in a union shop. What were there more than was there more than one union? Uh, no, I don't think so. I was think it, what was the union? Uh, oh, man, that's that's well, yeah, sixty years ago. <laughs> that's, okay. that's okay. Okay, so you worked there from what year? From sixty. Six, uh, uh, sixty-three to sixty sixty-five, uh, I think. Okay. At which time I went to the University of Texas for the master's. Okay. So you, you had gotten your bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. And is that related in some ways to going back and doing some of the other jobs that you had done? Why mechanical engineering? Uh, well, we were mechanics. We, we were good with our hands. We could fix things. And so I, you know, so I'd be a mechanical engineer. You know, that's a, I mean, those things... We had no, we we had no counselors, no body that directs you. We we're, were in Laredo, you know. It you, it was, it's, uh, just didn't have the the feedback. And as a matter of fact, and, and, you know, I remember when I asked my my trigonometry teacher, she says, you know, do you think that I have the intellect to go to Texas A and M? She says, no, you don't. And so then I took the ACT or whatever, whatever test we took back then, and I scored in the top 1% out of the country. And I said, well, <laughs> there has to be something related to being Mexican here. <laughs> you know? And so w when I got through the University of Texas, then when I took the admission test for graduate study in business, and I scored in the top 1% out of that. And I got my master's on the D's list. So, um, why business? At that time, it was, the, it was the end thing to do for engineers to go get an MBA. If you wanted to get into the management of engineering, to get into the MBA. Okay. And so that was the thing to do. I mean, that was about the time that Harvard came out with the MBA program for, for engineers. And so it was, it was the thing to do. 
Okay, and so again, it's, it was th those things were just trial and error. I mean, th there was no, you know, did I did not have the benefit of counsel or advice from from folks. You know, what do I do? Right. I just didn't have. It. So, wh what year did you graduate from UT? Sixty-six. And then you went to graduate studies at the University of Tennessee. I, I, I was recruited to go teach. I was recruited as a teaching fellow. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, again, again you know, I, I get to Tennessee, I'll, I'm going to be a teacher, an instructor, that's going to be working on a PhD. And, and uh, you know, uh, and this is something that I think you will identify with. Get the graduate students. I had three classes with 150 students each. It was mass lecture, and, and I'm, as you can tell, I'm, I got the ability to. And so I, I had uh, four and uh, 450 students a a, a uh, trimester. Like then they were they were in quarterly, uh, by quarters. And and so I tell you, these guys are making three, four, five times what I'm making, and they have five or six students. I says, guys, I'm paying your salary, all of you, you know, because I'm producing 450 uh, students and three hours each, and, you know, 1,350 uh, uh, hours of credit every, every trimester. And, and so, and, and unfortunately, I came in the Department of Finance, which was my strength. And Tennessee did not have a PhD in finance. They had one in economics with a minor in finance. And so I got caught in the turf battle between the Department of Finance and the Department of Economics. And that's basically the reason I never wrote my dissertation. I was in that turf battle and could never get anywhere. And so we. How long did you stay there? Five years. Wow, that's a long time. Do you ever regret not getting your PhD? It's kind of one of those things that you wish you had done it, uh, and, and uh, you know, didn't happen. It didn't happen. I mean, I focused on making money. I went, and from there, I went to the associate dean of the Escuela Bancaria Superior de Centro America, and I started. And I wrote a book with James Van Horn from Stanford, and so I mean, I'm doing things, you know, and so I'm making money and. And so, but eventually, I think the the fact that I did not get the PhD, and then, and, and then I, I don't think I could have in that published parish environment that I, you know, that I would have, I could succeed because I'm not a published parish guy. I'm a people guy. I want to help people and do those kind of things. And so, so I had, man, yeah, I, I wish I'd have gotten it, but but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. So you were there from what year to what year? 1966 to 1970. Okay, so then you come back from that. So what do you do in 1970? Where do you go then? I went to LSU Baton Rouge. As oh, that's an, right. Yeah, as yeah. An assistant professor and the associate dean of the banking school of Central America. I had both jobs. So um, you were seemed drawn to teaching. Yes. You were there for how long at LSU? Five years. Okay. And then where did you go? Then after I that? went to. Texas, to Laredo State University, okay. which then became Texas A&I at Laredo and eventually became Texas A&M International at Laredo. And how and long were you I there? Was there? I was there, well, I was there a long time. I was there three full-time years, but then I stayed on as an adjunct faculty. Okay. And, and I don't recall for how many years, but it was certainly uh, 10. But, and, 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 and the thing is, my body just couldn't take it. By that time, I'd opened the bank in Sabata, and I was commuting to go teach uh, one or two nights a week, three-hour courses, come back and do the grading and all that kind of stuff. And it finally said, look, I'm, I'm not doing a good job. I just don't, ha I don't have the time. And, and Dr. Keck today asked me, you know, come back and teach. I said, so after, um, okay, after Laredo State University, then where'd you go? I went to the Laredo National Bank, and I was a foreign lender. I was lending uh, under the uh, Export-Import Bank uh, 
loans where the government guaranteed political risks. In other words, you, you know, a, 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 no bank is going to go and land uh, 300, 400 million dollars in a foreign country without, you know, your, your foreign country, foreign le uh, uh, legal processes, uh, you know, and then things that happen in foreign countries. And so we did, we did the financing under what's called the Export-Import Bank, uh, XM Bank, and they would guarantee 75% of the commercial risks and 100% of the political risks. And so, uh, uh, well, you know, I spent three weeks out of the month in Mexico, Guadalajara, uh, Torreón, Monterrey, Mexico, Puebla, you know, Tampico, Victoria, you know, spent a lot of time in Mexico doing loans, and, and uh, it, was a, it was a very profitable uh, venture. But then came 1983. If you recall, in 1983, Mexico devalued from 22 pesos per dollar. It went boom, 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 200, 300, 400 pesos per dollar, and then eventually it got to about two, three thousand, and then they dropped off three zeros. You know, eventually, uh, somewhere they dropped off three three zeros from their currency, and they talked about nuevos pesos, and and so so, but but the worst part was that during that devaluation, they said, okay, all you guys that have dollar deposits in Mexico. We're going to convert them into pesos at, uh, if I remember correctly, it was uh, something like 50 pesos per dollar. So here's your account. You had $100,000. Now you have uh, 5 million pesos. Well, I don't want a bank here anymore. So we'll, we'll sell you your dollars at 200 pesos per dollar. So right there, they wiped out 75% of your net worth. The fact that they made it illegal for any Mexican to have dollar deposits, they confiscated all of the banks. And the government now owns Banamex, Bancomer, and all those. But that's a political risk. And so we filed uh, claims against the Exxon Bank for all those loans that they couldn't pay. They won't let me have dollars. The country will not let me have dollars. I can't pay you. And so we filed political risk, on, and, and the government ended up having to pay uh, huge amounts of money. The government... The that, U.S. government. U.S. government, yeah. That, we paid a premium. Hey, here's the insurance. But what happened is they now came to look at the fine print to find a way to get out of pain. And so, some of the issues there, let's you know, give, go through an example. You buy a plane. You go up to Wichita, Kansas, to Cessna, and say, I want to buy this twin-engine $2 million plane, $1 million plane. We go through the, the Exim Bank for approval. You know, we have this customer. Here's what he's buying. We're getting a lien on the plane, blah, 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 blah. And uh, there's a lot of things happening simultaneously. But at the time of the deal, Cessna would write out an invoice to the customer. Here it is. You give us a down payment, you know, 100000 whatever. Now I want you to put this kind of equipment, you know, communications or navigation or whatever. I want you to paint it this color. I want you to put these letters. I've got to go through the process of deregistering the plane with the FAA, re-registering it with Aeronautica Civil in Mexico, and then go to Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores and get an import permit. And so, you know, it wouldn't take maybe a year to, to get all those things done. And so finally, the uh, Cessna would send us an invoice saying, here's a flyaway bill, bill of lading where it took off to Mexico. 
and hear pop, pop, pop. Unfortunately, the invoice was dated one year ago. There's a little fine print says that you have to notify Exim Bank within 30 days of the purchase. This is 12 months later. Had we, ha had we predicted that, we would have said, give me a new invoice with today's date, because this is when the sale is occurring. Uh, and so that was one example. Another example is you have merchandise that they order special, a special uh, use type of merchandise. And so the bank would issue a letter of credit to secure the fabrication of that merchandise. And then upon sale, we'd go and go through the HCM bank process. And those, and that's, and, 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 and so in the first situation of the aircraft, XM Bank said, well, you're, you lied about the invoice date. Here it is, and here's when it actually sold. If it's here, if we're sold, then it's not covered. And in the other case, it said, well, you actually financed it with a letter of credit first. And then you came back six months later and, and financed it under XM Bank, but that's already sold back over there. And so the uh, final analysis of that was that XM Bank indicted me for false documents to the government on a 10 count indictment in, in uh, the federal court in McAllen. I'm the young president of the bank. I'm 40 years old. I'm the president of IBC Zapata when all this stuff comes up. And from then on, uh, it was every first Monday we set for trial. And the previous week, TV, newspapers, Renato Ramirez going to trial, 15 years in prison, you know, a million dollars in fines and whatever. You know. And so it was a very tough time. Uh, and we'd get to go to court, and government asked for a continuance to continue preparing the case. Granted, granted, five years. Five years you, with your hammer on your head. You continue to be the president of the bank, you continue to have your bank grow, you continue to make money, and you continue to get warrants from the examiners on, on the quality of the bank management, the quality of what we do. But inside, that's when you say that guy's tough, you know. And so finally in 1987, of course it was 83 when all that stuff happened. In 1987, in December, uh, went to court. Government asked for continuance. I said, Judge, can I speak? I said, yes, sir. Got up. I said, I don't know if you understand what happens to me when we go through these processes. I said, I'm a fighter and I know what I'm talking about and I know that no crime has been committed. I get ready. On every one of those 10 cases that I was charged, I understand that credit ex completely and it is no criminal activity. I'm ready to fight. Come in, big let down. So I'm depressed for two weeks, but then get ready again. Review my documents. I'm ready to fight. Been going on for five years. Does anybody here believe that these guys are going to be ready on January 2nd? I don't. You ruined my Thanksgiving. Now you're going to ruin my Christmas. Hey, they wanted to get in the ring with me. Let's go. And so February 19th, that he put the continuance not to January. He says, you won't be ready to January. So he puts it to February in 1988. February sometime, some date, whatever date it was, 18, 19, whatever it was. So we get there, and they sit the jury. And that's when you really get scared. I had two farm cracker operators unemployed for two years on the jury. I said, are we kidding? Do these guys know about... Flyaway bills of lading, bills of lading, 
uh, on, on stuff put in the in the in the uh, rail car uh, in bond. This will export occur when you cross when you put the machine on on the rail when it crosses the physical border when it crosses the legal border goes out of in bond in Mexico and you've got two farm cracker operators in, uh, that are I mean unemployed for two years they're going to be the jury and then I, and, and so I told my I told my attorney I said we're screwed. And so I was sitting there ready to go to trial. I said, we're screwed. And the bailiff comes up and says, the judge wants to see you in chambers. He called for a recess. He goes over and tells the prosecuting attorney, the uh, judge wants to see you in chambers. He says, I'm going to take my FBI agents with him. He's going to take one. So we go in chambers, and uh, he said, Mr. and so the judge said, "Mr. Braddock, how many cases did you look at?" He said, "A hundred, no, four hundred, four hundred cases. How much money was involved? A hundred million dollars. Did Renato Ramirez make any money on any transaction?" He said, "No." Did any company he owned make any money on the transaction? He said, "No." Did the merchandise go to Mexico? Yes. Did the people in Mexico recognize that they owe the money? Yes. Where's the crime? He said, well, the invoice they don't match it. He says, that is, at best, a sloppy administrative procedures, not a criminal act. And I resent you using my court to keep the government from facing their insurance obligations. He said, you go in that room and negotiate a settlement with Mr. Ramirez. So we walk in, and my eye was like, somebody took a huge load off of me. Damn, I can breathe. Walked in, and how can we settle? So the FBI agent says, well, we'll give you a uh, deferred adjudication. And I said, what does that mean? Well. You plead guilty, and we'll give you 30 days. If you don't do anything wrong in 30 days, it's off your books. It's not on the record. And then Renato Ramirez came out. I said, fella, I just heard the judge say there was no criminal activity involved here. And he hope you all have tolerance for it. Fuck you. <laughs> My attorney said, well, I said, I'm not afraid of these guys. They're bureaucrats. I'm not afraid of them. So I said, the only thing I'm going to accept is a one-sentence motion saying government's motion to dismiss the indictment is hereby granted, period. And so he said, well, we're going to give you a pre trial diversion. I said, well, what is that? He said, well, there's a document here that will say that this has been reported and in the interest of justice it's better that you are recognizing you're responsible for your actions and it's over it's done okay so i'm signing a paper that says nothing and you're going to say he signed a paper and i'm going to say i signed nothing that's a cop out so he eventually ended up with a one sentence motion, the government's motion to dismiss hereby granted. I'm done. It's over. But that was a very difficult time for me. It was at the prime time of my, my economic growth and I had to hold back because I didn't know what the outcome. My kids were 15, 16, 17. They had to suffer through that. So, but at the end of the day, the president of Laredo National Bank got the whole staff together and said, guys, uh, I really have some some bad feelings about what the government did to because L and B was also indicted, and what they did to Renato. But I'm going to tell you that I find no fault in what he did. I'm going to tell you he's a tough guy. He can take it. He can take a blow to the chin. He won't go down. Because immediately they came in and said, "Look, we will let you off the hook. Just point the finger at Max Mandel or Gary Jacobs." I said, you indicted me, you wanted to get in the ring with me. You're going to get in the ring with me. 
Who are Gary Mandel and? Gary Jacobs. Oh. Uh, the, was the CEO of Laredo National Bank and Max Mandel was the owner, his father-in-law. And they wanted to get the big fish. And I said, no. And so he said, you know, and as a matter of fact, Gary Jacobs was one of the biggest pushers to get me in Mr. South Texas. And so, it's, you know, I said, okay, it's over. And, and the attorney, the, the U.S. attorney, you know, Mr. Ramirez, I want to thank you for not whipping my ass. Because <laughs> I had that period there in 1988 when I was just not very tolerant. And I got into about five or six fist fights. And <laughs> So, and, and they, but they were tracking me, you know, says, you got another fight or not, I was involved in it. <laughs> and so, you know, he just said, you know, I want to thank you for not whipping my ass. And I said, well, fella, it's a federal felony to hit a federal officer. <laughs> Otherwise, you might have made it. <laughs> but thank God it was over and they'd get back and, 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 you know, the proof of, what a, how I've managed my life is there with a bank, you know, 30 years of growth, 30 years of profitability, you know, 30 years of, of ones in, in terms of the ratings for examiners, and well-managed bank and so on. And so, and it's not, it was not a, you know, fluke. It's, we've done it for 30 years, year after year after year. Even during the indictment, I kept growing, I kept doing the right thing, and, you know, and kept taking, kept taking the shots of the ribs, and uh, hey, I can take it, you know. So, so uh, Renata, what, what, um, how did that affect your thinking, or did it change your thinking at all, before the indictment and after the indictment? Well, you become a lot more uh, aware that these things can blow up on you, and that's one of the things I've, I've, I've tried to impart on Ricky, who is in a position where you do things kind of not thinking about it and when you come back and you know just for example uh i sold a truck and so the guy wanted to get it financed i said no I'm not here go to the sabata national bank and he says i'll do it i said no we're not going to do it because that money is coming to my pocket and that is a felony we're not it's a felony if i don't let anybody know to do it, I'd have to go get the board together, get an appraisal on the truck. Da, 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 da. No, we're not going to do it. And, and so you become very worry, worry about, you know, look at the consequences, and 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 not necessarily what the the reality of what you did, you know, can be explained away. But a gung ho prosecutor investigator that wants to get you because he wants that notch on his gun I got me a bank president you know look at that consequence so don't even expose yourself and so that that's the one thing that is it you know I'm extremely careful I, right now I offered a I've got a half block that this lady wants I said, I'll sell it to you for $120,000 she said will you finance it for me I said no and she's been back to the bank finance it for me I said no you go to Zapata National you go to Laredo I'm not going to finance it because it's going to go in my pocket and it's, you know, so, so you become very aware of those things, very aware of, of uh, uh, that, that uh, and, 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 you know, I mean, over the years, uh, I've had sting operations sent my way because in 1988, it did not end. You did not what? It did not end. The FBI was really bothered that they could not nail me. And so then I had a guy named uh, Joe Lozano, who's, who died already, thank God. Uh, he came in and said, Mr. Ramirez, I can, I can deliver hay to your ranch for $1.75 a bale. And I said, why would you do that? He said, well, I just like to stay active and not really trying to make money. I said, you kidding me? I said, you got a little half-ton truck with a little 16-foot trailer. The most you can put is 80 bales. You're going to drive 200 miles to get horse-quality hail, uh, horse-quality hail, hay. And I said, uh, in the field, it's going to cost you a dollar and a half. So you're going to spend $20 in fuel to go down there. I said, unless what you're really getting at is you're going to have a little load that you need to store somewhere because it's kind of, that it cools down. 
No, we don't. I don't do that. Okay. And and uh, then the other thing that I did in 1988, I said I won my record. And he said, "Well, well, take your little time." I said, "I won my record." And so, in five years later, five years later, 1983-84, they gave me my record. You would not imagine, eight inches. And they had, they did drug purchases to find if they could find my fingerprints on the plastic bags. They, they had everything they did, they would communicate from here to all the way to uh, Connecticut, to Chicago, to all the FBI officers. I mean, they really did, you know, did a number on me. And, but then this guy, Joe Lozano, wrote some crap that was just indefensible. I mean, it just, just, I mean, it just, and, and so it, it was, uh, and, and they sent that Joe Lozano, and then they sent another guy, and, you know, that comes in, I've got $3 million to bring into the bank, I'm going to bring a little bit of time, ten fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, you know, just to, and I said, whose money is this? He's my dad's. I said, tell your dad I want to meet him. Oh, my dad's too busy. He's in Monterey, and I said, I got a plane. He has to go to lunch, tell him I'll meet him for lunch wherever he wants to. Or Mirador, or wherever he wants to go have lunch, I'll, I'll go have lunch with him. And I said, but I, I want Acta Constitutiva, Poderes de Funcionarios, Estados Financieros, La, misa, uh, la Visa Lacra, um, uh, with the, La Visa, with the, with the, what the hell they call it? It's uh, the electronic thing. I said, I want that electronic photo and all that. Láser, la visa láser, con su retrato y todo. Y dije, el dinero me lo mandas por orden de pago. And orden de pago is a phrase that does not translate into the U.S. What is an orden de pago? An order to pay. Okay. In Mexico, it's a wire transfer. In Mexico, it's a wire transfer. That means no orden de pago. That means I wired the money to you. And so... This guy looks at me and says, ¿Qué es una orden de pago? Y dice, pues mira, tú cabrón, ni rico ni mexicano. ¿Quién eres? And I told the guy with him, I said, you got an undercover agent that's trying to put you on skip and send you down the hill, okay? And one year later, they played that recording in court, and he went to do seven years in prison. Te dije. <laughs> so you become much more alert. So who was the guy who had gone with the undercover agent? The former county judge is about the county. And he went to jail? Seven years. Jose Luis Guevara. Because I... Th and and I might add that the other guy that got caught was the sheriff who happened to be my brother. I said, what? The? I told you. I said, I'm going to go with an undercover agent. What the? I told you. The guy said... You know, you have a little ranch out there in uh, Lake Falcon, 30 acres. And he says, we, please don't go over there tonight because I'm going to pass some drugs through there. Here's $20,000. My father says, I never go over there. You, I wouldn't, I mean, I, have, I haven't been to that place in 25 years. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, I did it my part to my brother. I said, hey, I don't want that. I don't want a little piece that far away. I got to go through, you know, 25 miles, 15 miles of dirt road, a bunch of wire gaps that got to be opening and closing. What for? Go down there, there's no infrastructure. It's just a piece of land on the lake that's beautiful. It's got a huge hill overlooking the Lake Falcon, the, 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 the dam. Overlooking the dam, it's beautiful. But he said, you know, I don't go. He wanted to give me $20,000 for not go. I wasn't going. So, boom. You know, and he ended up doing 15 months in prison. Which is really sad because my brother is, you know, is a one really a good guy. But when they, when they got it, when when they uh, news broke out and I bailed him out, I said, "Give me the documents and see." I went through. I said, "They got you, plea bargain. They got you because they got you on money laundering. They got you on accepting a bribe. Yeah, plea bargain." So he plea bargained and got 15 months. But it must have changed his life because he was a sheriff. 
Hmm? He was the sheriff. Mm -hmm. So what what did he do afterwards? Well, he no, he's a very fairly good. He, he is as good on any piece of equipment as I am in the bank. I mean, I don't care. You put him on a maintainer, a doser, or a backhoe, whatever. So he has a little construction company, and he makes good money. And, and so, I mean, but, but he loved being in the public eye, which I don't, you know, I, I mean, I don't like that political appointment, political thing, you know. I'm not, if you ever say, why don't you run? I said, for what? Or run for governor. I said, no, <laughs> I wouldn't run for any position, any, none. Just, just won't. Um, okay, so so you worked at Laredo National Bank. Is there any relationship between Laredo National Bank and International Bank of Commerce? <laughs> there wasn't then, but there is now. Oh, there is. Gary Jacobs' uh, son married Tony Sanchez's daughter, <laughs> but there is no no. And, and since Laredo National sold to Compass Bank, and so Laredo National has disappeared, and so there is no relationship. Subsequent to all that. The big competitors, Tony Sanchez and Gary Jacobs, their children get married. <laughs> That's too funny. Yeah. So you worked, uh, you worked there at Laredo National Bank. Uh, what years? Seventy-eight to eighty-three. And then you went from there to I IBC. I came and opened a bank at IBC. Here okay, so here. you know, one thing I was, I was going through all the documents, and I didn't quite understand. It sounds like IBC Zapata. Is its own it is. entity. It is. What is the relationship between IBC Zapata? They own all my shares. Who does? I, International Bank Shares okay. Corporation. IBC Laredo owns all of the shares of IBC Zapata. So you don't own any shares? Not in IBC Zapata. I own in bank shares. Oh, I see. Okay. And, and so the, they own the bank, and, and it's, but it's a separate corporation. I have my own board of directors, uh, you know, like, uh, I, uh, I'm the CEO of this bank, and, and uh, so so it's it's separate but together. I see. Yeah. Okay. So the reason that you wouldn't you wouldn't own the shares in this is because because 100 percent of the shares of IBC Zapata are owned by International Bank Shares Incorporated, a holding company that owns 100 percent of the shares of Commerce Bank, 100 percent of the shares of IBC Brownsville, and 100 percent of the shares of IBC Laredo, and so they own. Uh, all the shares, and so. So they so IBC wanted to start a bank in Zapata. Is that right? How how well, did that well, work out? Well, the, the thing is, back then, uh, in the 1983-84, uh, Texas banking law did not allow for branch banking other than within two miles of your existing facility. And and uh, and so when when they wanted to build. Uh, bank in North Laredo, where IBC Laredo is downtown, that was outside the two miles or whatever the distance was. You know, it, it, I, I think it was two miles. So it was outside the two-mile range. So they formed Commerce Bank in Laredo as a separate corporation. And then at that time, they said, we're going to grow. So they formed IBC Zapata and IBC Brownsville. By the 1985, 86, 86 I think it was, Texas uh, legislature changed the law and allowed for statewide banking. So subsequent to 85, all banks that IBC has opened are branches of one of us. In other words, the branch in Rio Grande, the three branches in Rio Grande, Roma, Zapata, Hebron, Freer, two branches in Beeville, two in Kingsville, one in Alice, they're all part of IBC Zapata. The branches in Harlingen and uh, Port Isabel, South Padre Island, are part of IBC Brownsville. And, and then Commerce Bank has four branches in Laredo. And, and, and so then the, the rest of them, IBC, Austin, San Antonio, Eagle Pass, Del Rio, Houston, Oklahoma, they're all branches of IBC Laredo. So how, does, um, how do you count, because I kept on seeing that you were the fastest growing or, or something like that, the well, IBC I, Zapata. I, I, at one time I was, I, you know, went from zero to $550 million. Now I'm not, now we're not growing. 
we're not growing by choice. There's no loan opportunity. And so uh, what are you doing? What are you gonna do with money when you grow? Somebody brings in me, you know, somebody brings in a hundred million dollars. And that's an interesting that's an interesting side comment that I can make about about the impact of the Eagles for Trail. You know, if you're familiar, the Eagles for Trail goes from Carrizo Springs all the way to Gonzalez, Goliad, uh, uh, Victoria, Beeville, all those areas. And so what has happened in the concrete example I'll give you is, is uh, uh, Stockland National Bank in Cotula, but it's the same thing for First National Bank of uh, uh, Beeville or Brush Country Bank in Freer. They're independent banks. And so here you are in Cotula. You've got a little bank for a little community that's dead. And so you have $50 million in assets. You have $3 million in capital to satisfy the regulators with a 6% capital ratio. All of a sudden, boom, comes Eagle for sale. And you have an influx of $100 million in deposits. Because people are getting half a million a month in royalties. Boom, 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 boom. And so all of a sudden, you've got $100 million in your deposits. You have $150 million. But your equity didn't change. So you got $3 million in capital. And here comes the feds, the regulators, saying, you have a deficiency in capital, you got to make it up. How do I make it up? Well, three ways you can do it. One, retain all earnings. But that came at a time when interest rates are the lowest they've ever been. You know, you're making 2% on bonds. So you know, you're netting 0.5, 0.6% a year on your assets. So you got $50 million, you net 0.5, that's $250,000. That's all I can add to capital from internal growth. So the other thing is, you can run deposits off. Well, that don't make sense. I'm making money on those deposits. We got to run them off because you don't have enough capital to support them. The third thing you can do is issue stock. Well, there's two problems there. Number one, because of what's happened in the market, I used to make 20, 25% on equity. I'm making 10, 12% now. But most banks are making 6%. Most banks are making 5 or 6%. You're gonna buy stock that's gonna pay you 5%? No. So I can't find people that wanna invest in, in that kind of a, a rate. And if I find someone, what's gonna happen is, I got to issue more shares than I have and I've lost control of the bank and it's somebody else's. And so Stockman National Bank says, you know what? I'll sell the bank, start lock, stock and barrel. So they sold it to a holding company from San Antonio. And now for rural America, that's a really bad situation because all of these little banks that were servicing Hebronville and Freer and Kingsville and Alice, all of a sudden now they're controlled by Prosperity in Houston or uh, some such bank, some similar bank that has a uh, template for decision making and they're not in tune with the community. And so you get no loans. So you cannot support local businesses that mom pa operations and little $50,000 loan, $100,000 loan, you can't support them. And so that's what's happened in rural America, and that's a real danger, that co the community banks are headed for extinction. We're losing one a day. It's a great story. Mm -hmm. it's and, so, and, and it's a tribute to those of us that are still standing, that we can continue, to, to, but, but it, it, it takes some really paying attention to, to detail and and, uh, and and you know uh, you have you have uh, you, to to always look at being within the law and you always have to look at at uh, how is this going to impact capital ratios profitability ratios and all those kinds of things and many times you turn the deposit down so it's not interested thank you you see so not what interested. do they do with their deposits then Go look somewhere else. Wow. I, you know, that's not my problem. That's their problem. Yeah. 
Okay, so you came to IBC in 83, is that correct? Uh, I came on July 1st of 1983, and I opened the doors to the bank in February, I think it was February 4th, 1984. Okay, and we're still there, you're still there. I'm still there. And do you have any plans of retiring? Uh, no, you know, so long as I'm in good health, so long as the bank is satisfied with what I'm doing, what are the changes that happen to a person as they get older? You become a little bit less tolerant. And there's sometimes that customers uh, just really get on my nerves. <laughs> And, and, and the thing is, there's been a change. There's been a change in, the, in our community. It used to be people would respect bankers and they treat you with respect. They'd come in, you know, it's like kind of, I'm going to church, I got to dress up, I'm going to the bank, I got to dress up. Now they walk in with tong tongs and shorts and a, uh, and a, and a t shirt, and, and then very, they very freely will cuss you out. And, and of course, they're not going to put up with that. I, mean, I, just, I, I just had a couple of incidents where. Guy starts cussing and says, whoa, call the cops. Man being abusive of my tellers, boom, handcuff him, take him in. That's what I do. Okay, we're going to switch over to political identity. So before you, military, uh, before you entered into the military, were you a member of a political party? Were you Democrat? Uh, no. No, you weren't? No. No, okay. And how about afterwards? Well, I've never been a member of, of any political party, although my philosophy and my orientation is very pro-Republican. Okay. Did you, never mind, on this, before uh, military service, did you belong to any organizations like church groups or anything? I don't know whether that question is aimed at. Obviously, in high school, I was the editor in chief of the La Pitaya, the, the yearbook, and I was on the slide rule club and things like that. But, but other than, so if you're asking me, was I a member of Rotary or Lions or any of those organizations? No. Okay. Afterwards, I know you're in a lot of different organizations. Uh, really, I'm not much of a joiner. Uh, and, but, and when I do join, I go in and, no. I'm, right now, I am a board member of the Texas Civil Rights Project. I think that's extremely important. I am a board member of the Futuro Media Group, uh, Marina Hosas. I think that's very important. Uh, I was on the board of KLRN, the PBS station in San Antonio, but I just couldn't serve and be satisfied with what I did for them. You know, it's, they wanted me to say, what do you think of the programming? Well, I'm not a television guy. I never watched television. And much less PBS and Sesame Street and that, you know, man, that's, 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 that's just not what I do. And so I cannot provide much input into them. Then on top of that, it was a 400 mile trip to go to a board meeting for an hour. And it meeting was always at four o'clock in the afternoon. Well, that means I got an overnight stay. So really it's 24 hours out of my life that I, I just, you know, as I go forward, it's higher and higher percentage of the remaining. <laughs> Okay, um, did your family go to church before you were in the military? Did y'all, did you grow up? Uh, yes, we, we uh, were very active in church and then, then we kind of dropped off. Like uh, once a week or? We used to go to church on Sundays, yes. Okay, what church was it? And, and, and Ricky and his family, and Bobby and her family still go to church. And Rick and Reuben and his family. We, I, I guess, to a great extent, my... Uh, Desertion from the Catholic Church locally was the result of a local priest. He's an absolute idiot. And that's, 
I mean, the guy, I walk into church and he says, you know, we have the banker over there. He loves his money more than he does Jesus. <laughs> what can I say? Or when I, I bought a ranch in Jordan, the banker bought a ranch in Jordan. He wants to go to church up there because he doesn't like us. <laughs> so you sit there and, and the, the straw that broke the camel's back when 16 years ago Ricky was going to get married and they went for the free marriage um, conferences and so on. And so his wife went in and she said, I want to get married. I said, we get married. I said, Ricardo Ramirez. I said, Renato, sir? He said, yes. He said, don't marry him. They're bad people. <laughs> and so she goes home crying. And she, you know. So I went up and said, hey, guy, why would you say I'm a bad person? I said, are you aware of what I do? You understand I've got an orphanage in Mexico that I, I support 100% of the financial needs for, 20, for 30 children? Are you familiar that I built a golf course so the community could have a place to, to play golf at my expense? I built a boys girls club. You know, gave them about three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars. You gave a million dollars to Texas A&M International. Why would you say I'm a bad guy? And she says, no, I didn't say that. No, yeah, you did. You told it to my, my uh, prospective daughter-in-law. He said, well, tell your son not to marry her because she's a gossip. <laughs> and so, I went to the bishop and I said, my son's going to get married. I want him out of town that week and I want you to send a priest from Laredo. Do we understand each other? I gave him a check for $1,000 for the parking, to, to, to redo the parking lot in front of the church and he sent it back to me. He wouldn't take money from, he said he wouldn't take money from, uh, the hell is the name of that? The Masons. He wouldn't take money from Masons. I said, well, I'm, I'm not a Mason. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what you're talking about. But he sent it back. He's an idiot. He was, I, you know, you got to feel sorry for him. He's not connected. You know, he's got already some signs of dementia and uh, Alzheimer's. And, but he was attacking me and attacking me and attacking me. And so, so that's, that's kind of what... I have a very good relationship with a priest now, but now I've got in the habit of not going to church. <laughs> what is the name of that church? Uh, Our Lady Lourdes. Is that in Zapata? Yes. Okay. So is that the church that you grew up with? Yes. Okay, so it's always been the same church. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, okay. This is this. Some of these are going to sound kind of um, silly, but I ask. We ask them. Did you listen to radio stations? The what? Listen to radio stations. Uh, not very much, you know. I, I waste a lot of money on Sirius and, 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 and all that kind of stuff, but I really don't... But when you were growing up, did you listen to radio? Oh, yes. What, yes. what radio well, stations? Well, you know, back in, in, the, in the 50, early 50s in Zapata, no movies, no, no television, no nada. And so what we had back then was, was uh, Ruperto Villarreal, the broadcaster for Los Tecolotes in, La, in Nuevo Laredo, the baseball team. And we were all Tecolote fans. And, and here vienen los rieleros, y vienen los, los, los sultanes de Monterrey, los Diablos Rojos, and, you know, and, and it was, in, and, and uh, uh, Ruperto Villarreal had the ability to bring the game to life. And so every evening, We'd huddle around this little radio, no, 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 not any big stereo, no, any little radio, and we'd huddle around and listen, and viene el grillo sobre la and, you know, el, el, uh, el grillo sobre el, and el, el tildío Villarreal, and, you know, we had all those weird names that all these ball players had, the little nicknames, you know. What station was it? Do you remember? Whatever it was in Nuevo okay. Laredo, X, X, XCL or something like that, I, okay. I, I don't remember. It was owned by Ruperto Villarreal. And as a matter of fact, Ruperto Villarreal's granddaughter oh. is a marketing director at IBC in Laredo. Really? Interesting. And, and, it, was a, and, and it was an interesting story back then. And, and so when I asked Gabby, I said, Gabby, ¿qué, qué familia tienes tú? He said, well, my grandfather was Ruperto Villarreal. I said, Ruperto Villarreal, one del batazo. <laughs> and he said, 
there was a game really exciting. And <laughs> here comes whatever the name of the guy was. Viene a batear, le viene lanza en una, en una fastball, y le da un batazo a la chingada, güey. <laughs> He was banned from radio for a year. And so he said, you know, my grandfather did so many good things and everybody remembers that one. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if there's any recordings left of that. Uh, I guess they are, but they're not going to, they don't want to. No, they, I, I just mean of the radio stick. Part. Okay, do you remember any uh, favorite songs, performers? Um, um, obviously, from... <laughs> growing up, Jose Alfredo Jimenez, uh, uh, este, uh, Sánchez, ¿cómo se llama? De, de México. Miguel Aceves Mejía and, and Pedro Infante, Jorge Negrete. Those were, you know, when we were growing up, the, the music that we liked. Rosita, 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 whatever her name was. You know, the corridos and that kind of stuff. That's our, that was our favorite music back then. Okay. Um, did you list, read any magazines and newspapers? Back then? Yeah. There weren't any. <laughs> Y'all, I mean, they had uh, newspaper in Laredo, right? Yeah, with Zapata. We, you know, oh, Zapata okay. but we didn't have any newspapers in Zapata. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and so uh, you enlisted in the military, in the Army? I'm sorry? You enlisted in the Army? In uh, well, I, I was in the mandatory corps at A&M, which gave me the commission, which meant I went in. And okay. Whether I enlist, volunteer, or whatever it was, but I, yes, I went in the Army. Okay. Um, okay. So, what was the, the your unit name? Well, actually, I was, that was one of a, a really um, screwed up, two-year period because I went in, I was, uh, it was when the Vietnam was getting started, the Cuban crisis and all that time. And so I had been inducted for a six-month period. Mm -hmm. And once I went in, I said, no, you're staying for 12 months, or 24 months. But they had no idea what they're going to do with us. They just extended all of us. And so I was assigned to the uh, field artillery school in Fort Sill, Oklahoma as an instructor. In a one year period as an instructor, I taught four 15 minute classes. <laughs> and they were the same class. <laughs> and I had to stay within the script because it was approved. I had to follow the script. I had to memorize this 15 minute script about the corporal missile system, what it did. And at that time, it was already obsolete. They had obsolete, they have developed so many, many other uh, uh, missile systems, the sergeant and then some other, the other kind of weaponry. And so basically, I had nothing to do. And, and but then when the Cuban crisis broke out, boom. Uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, to train Cubans. I was a commander of a company of Cubans. And in, in, in the process, you know, and, and there I was already almost out of the Army. I had nine months to go, and I was a short-timer. It was, it was really, you know, not very well planned. And so I kind of got cheated because I did not ever get assigned to a particular unit you know, the 101st Airborne or whatever it was. I never got assigned to a unit. And, and, and I was, so, so uh, in, in, with the Cubans, I, I took them through training and I became a, a pebble crusher, you know, because, because it was infantry. I'm sorry, what, a pebble crusher, okay. Yeah. You know, it was an infantry, you're gonna, you're gonna march. And, 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 But 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 I was trained in artillery, so it, it, you know, so so it, it was just a, a comedy of. It, it was just bad. So but Fort Jackson is in North Carolina or South Carolina? Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Okay. It's in. 
And so, so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm training people in, in infantry, which really means conditioning, marching, uh, uh, going up hills and stuff like that. Well, from my wrestling and from that, I'm in condition to do those things. I can, I can run six miles, 10 miles and no problem. You know, so, so I did that and, and finally my time was up and I said, I'm going, thank you. So what was that like working with the Cubans? It was interesting. I, you know, I used to tell them, I said, I wouldn't go to war with you guys. And my, I said, I want Tejanos, Valientes, because they saben, saben pelear. You guys, you guys always look for an excuse, because they, they really, the, the, it was the, the creme of the crop of the Cuban population that was thrown out by Castro, not the working folks. And so they are always looking for somebody to take care of them. And, and it, it, was, it was kind of frustrating. And, and uh, so, you know, I mean, and just, and that's, that's my advice to people is, is, you know, learn how to make your own bed, pick up your laundry, go put it in the hamper, shine your own shoes, and those kinds of things. You gotta be self-sufficient. These guys weren't, and it was frustrating. And, and an interesting sight when I'd call mom, and say, hey mom, ¿cómo está? Ya no te entiendo tu español. Because I'd taken on the Cuban dialect. You know, some of the, all, those, all those weird words that they use. You know, so how, about how many Lawawa and, and stuff like that? How many uh, men were you training? I think our company had about I don't know, 150, 200 people that okay. I, I trained. And had my staff of sergeants, and we'd go out and go out and shoot, and go out and, and crawl through the brush and pick up jiggers and all that kind of stuff. So, but first you were in Oklahoma. Where were you? At Fort Sill. Fort Sill. Okay. Okay. So when were you discharged? Uh, September 14, 1963. And what was your final rank? Your final rank? Uh, first lieutenant. And if, do you by chance have any uh, copies of your discharge papers at some point? Uh, I didn't see them in there, but maybe uh, if, if you do, if we can get them, that'd be great. Okay. And you were discharged in South Carolina? Y uh, yes. Did you get any uh, medals or decorations while you were in the military? No, no not in the uh, kind of stuff I did. I mean, okay. We didn't get those. So when the, the Vietnam War was going on at the time, what kinds of... Actually, the Vietnam War started in er, in, in sometime in the, in May, June of 63. So by American Legion standards and military standards, I am a Vietnam veteran, but I had no exposure to even going to Vietnam. Like, but but what was your awareness of what was going on in Vietnam? Well, it, n not really. I mean, uh, there, any more than people were aware of what we were doing with the Cubans. I mean, there were very limited information being just passed around. The Vietnam War really kicked off, you know, after after when when Johnson was president. So okay, so as far as the the Cuban Missile Crisis. What were you all aware? Like, did you talk to the Cubans that you were training? And what well, was their understanding? Here's what happened. Uh, the, when the Cuban Missile Crisis occurred in, in late 61 or early 62, uh, I think it was, whenever it was, we trained, the, the American Army trained the invaders of the Bay of Pigs. And that was a flop because of the Kennedys failure to deliver the support that they needed to de deliver. Uh, the, the, the air support to be able to invade a beach. And so it was a, it was a huge failure, you know. And, and the U.S. negotiated and paid. Mijo, quit making that noise. <laughs> so, so the U.S. paid a huge ransom to get all those guys back. But what do you do with them? You put them in the army. You give them, you're giving them a paycheck, you're putting them under control, rather than turn them loose on Florida. And no jobs, what's gonna happen to your crime rate, what's gonna, you know. So, so, so it was just one of those things, like I said, my two years were a screwed up two year period in the, in the military. Uh, and I had nothing to do with it. I mean, you had to do that. I was a six month guy and all of a sudden they made me 24 months. There was nothing for me to do, so I spent I spent, I think it was 15 months in, uh, in Fort Sill, during which I taught 
four 15-minute classes, the same class, every time, that same script. I used to sit there day in, day out, memorize the script, memorize the script, memorize the script. It was, it was a very boring time for me. So with the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, though, and, and the Bay of Pigs, um, were, you, were, were the, the Cubans, were they talking to you? They were in the military, they were in the oh, army. Oh, no, they came in the military, and I had good, I, had, I, I established very good uh, relationship with them, because we were, you know, I'm a people person, and, and, and uh, they had a tremendous, I'm the lieutenant, and I'm, I'm helping you out, and, but, but, but those guys were just really, um, they were themselves victimized in the sense that they were sent into, a, into a, a, the Bay of Pigs with no chance of winning. So these guys were the ones that, yes. that were? Yes. So what did they tell you about that? Well, they, they, they had some bitterness about it. I mean, but, and, and that's the reason the government brought them into the military. They said, you're going to be at Fort Jackson. We're going to train you because we're going to go back and we're going to go back. And, and of course, that never was going to happen. It, you know. did, you, did you have an idea that that was never going to happen when you were training them? No, I mean, they were 23 years old. Uh, you know, just, 20, just never thought of the long picture. You know. It was not particularly active politically back then. So never thought about it. Okay. Um, so you came back to Zapata after the war. I came to Corpus. Corpus. Okay. And why well, Corpus? I worked for Reynolds. Oh, that's where you work. Okay. So you worked for Reynolds, and then you ended. Okay, I got that. Okay. So now I'm sorry. This is taking a long time, but see, this is what I mean. That sometimes a lot of interesting things comes up in the form. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of part of the interview as well. Your father's name. Abel Ramirez. Okay. Uh, what was his date of birth? Do you know? Uh, November 23rd, 1907. How do you remember all these dates? We were just talking about this yesterday, <laughs> about how we can't remember a lot of our dates as well. <laughs> Where was he born? He was born in, Monta in Mexico. He, he was born in Zapata. Zapata, okay. And when did he die? He died in 1966 at age 59 of a massive heart attack. Did he die in Zapata? Mm-hmm. And you said that he had only gone to like the second or third grade or something? Second grade, uh-huh. And um, he worked, he had his own, his own company, his own Well, uh, my dad station. was just a mechanic. Mm -hmm. And then in 1940, when he enlisted in the military, they rejected him because he didn't speak English. And his mechanical ability, uh, uh, Peter Holt's father, Peter Holt, like the Spurs Holt, the uh, B.D. Holt uh, Caterpillar, mm -hmm. came in and says, Abel, I'll sell you these four tractors, uh, small D5, D5 Caterpillars with the scrapers. And my dad says, I don't have any money. He says, I'll finance you for I mean, I'll finance them for you. In 1940, he began a uh, service to do earthen ponds and land improvement for ranches. At that time, you have World War II going on, and there's rationing. So ranchers were getting lots of money for their cattle, but nowhere to spend the money. You have to have a coupon to buy. There's a three-year waiting period for a car. So these guys said to my dad, my dad said, well, let's do some, some ranch improvements. And so it's a, that sounds like a good idea. So my dad went on a 24-7 uh, working, two crews, you know, uh, 6 to 6 and 6 to 6. Take off Sunday during the day to do the maintenance on equipment. He went for about four years and making a ton of money. That's when he bought this ranch for $7 an acre. About these four thousand acres, and and then the end came. The war, end of the war came, and so people could then spend money and things. And so you know, he sold his equipment, and that's when we got into the service station business. Oh, I see. Okay. And we had this ranch, but but a ranch like this—that's subsistence economy for for anybody. You know, you you. A ranch in this in this drought area 
this ranch can maybe run uh, a total of 4,000 acres could maybe run uh, 100, 120 head. That means 100 calves back then at 40, 50 dollars a calf. You know, it was just not money. Not the money. Not, not, there was not, it was subsistence, subsistence economy. So that, so he was doing, he had the ranch, but he also but had But then we had the service station, the service to, station to provide a little bit more cash flow. Okay. And so that's why I learned how to ride and rope, but I also learned the pumping gas and changing oil and changing spark plugs and points and those kinds of things. So for your father, having the uh, the ranch was, it wasn't about making money or... It was a Latino thing about land ownership, that, that bias that we have. What is that? Pues, la reforma agraria. You know, in Mexico, it's, we own our land. It, it's, uh, that's big with Mexicanos. But he's not from Mexico, he's from Zapata. Well, see, but, 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 you know, we, we assimilate those, those uh, values. And even the Tejanos from here was about land ownership. Was, were his parents from Mexico? No, no. no? We, we, I, from I, I, do, I do not know how many generations back we go, his parents go. But back then, todo esto por puro mexicano? You know, I mean, to survive the 19, the, the, that, that horrible time period of 1830-1930 when Mexicanos were being killed right and left for their land. You know, I mean, when Texas Rangers killed Francisco and Manuel Gutierrez, uh, Lozano up here in Rivera and Bazan, and, you know, just a lot of reputable ranchers were killed in their ranch for their land. I mean, by, by Texas Rangers under the color of law. And so, so, so how far back, I, you know, I hear, I remember stories about uh, my great-grandfather, Papa Lucas, and he could get on a horse and take a couple of 50-cent pieces, and, and I'm talking about a horse that never been ridden, put them underneath his sole on his stirrups. He says, okay, turn him loose. And when the horse got tired and he got up, he'd get down and get, here's the 50 cent pieces. He would never come off the stirrups. I mean, he was, and, and so I hear those stories, and I don't know if they're true or not, I mean, but they, but they like to tell them. <laughs> so, and, and so uh, uh, when we go back in Texas, many generations, uh, the, the Ramirez family. Okay, so was your father, okay, okay, we have to break for a couple of seconds. Okay. Okay. So, um, do you feel like part of this may be um, the reluctance to have the Tejano monument? Is this is this symbolic or a sign of something else going on in the state of Texas? The the population of Mexican Americans keeps on growing. The old time Anglo population is shrinking. Uh, I think I think that the bulk of the Anglos have come to the realization that we have been teaching mythology in Texas history, and they want to tell the truth. And and I've and I've visited with a number of them. There can never be any doubt that you have racists. Yeah, I mean, there are some racist, completely anti-Hispanic, and, and you can tell them as soon as they open their mouth. Uh, but but, but you've got to ignore those people. I mean, those are small minds. They don't, they don't have any influence. They don't have any consequence. They just mouth. It's kind of like Donald Sterling. They, they, you know, I mean, why are we paying attention? I'm not. I, I, I don't care what he says. I mean, I, I just don't care. And so... Uh, when, when an official makes a statement about the border and I disagree with it, then I'm going to go get in your face, which is what I did with the local sheriff when he promoted the idea that Zapata was a violent county, that we had pirates on the lake, that we had ranchers abandoning their ranches because of violent muggings in their ranch and oil field going north because of uh, oil field workers getting mugged in, in, uh, at, the, at the well sites and that kind of stuff. Well, just give me a name. One guy, they got beat up. Give me a name. 
There isn't one. It's all got in his face. I, when was this? Uh, about three or four years ago. When, when David Hartley got killed. David Hartley, jet skis, you know, pirates on the lake. Uh, this guy was eight miles in Mexico. He wasn't killed in Zapata County. He was eight miles into Mexico down the Rio Salado. You know? So, so how, is that, how, how does that implicate anything about Zapata? You know? And, and uh, you know, and, so, so, so and I took him to task. And when Mr. Abbott made the remark about corruption in, uh, in, uh, along the border, I sent an email said, you know, uh, are you familiar with Kenneth Barfield? He's from Austin. He stole $4 million from David Dewhurst's campaign. You familiar with Tom DeLay? Money laundering, all kinds of other. Clean up Austin before you start throwing rocks at the border. And then, you know, he realized, and he has made special efforts, come to Laredo twice already. He attended my uh, Mr. South Texas luncheon and, and took 30 minutes with laudatory remarks about me. And, and so, so, I mean, you, you take him to task, but 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 Dumbo out there making comments. You know, I had one one roughneck here. I had a little encounter with about some things, and he says, "You know, you almost speak English as well as I do." I said, "Make no mistake, my friend. I speak English much better than you do." <laughs> but what does that prove? He's a dummy. He's, he, you know, he's a labor. And so I'm, I'm wasting my time. Just, just let it go and go on, go on your way. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the Tejano versus Latino issue <laughs> okay. that you feel very strongly about. I feel very strongly about that. Tell me why. Well, uh, I think the reality of life in Texas is that 500 years of Tejano history and I'm talking about people who came here from Spain or even from Spain to Mexico to Texas when Texas was part of Mexico. Uh, I think that there's 500 years of history that has been buried. And, and I, I would like to see universities focus on Mexican-American studies to bring out what people like Alonso de Leon and, and Alvar Nunez de Cabeza de Vaca and Alonso Alvarez de Pineda and uh, Jose Escandón, Bernardo Gutierrez de Lara, uh, Don Tomás Don, uh, Sánchez, uh, José Antonio Navarro, Juan Seguin, Martín de Leon. All of these guys did over 500 years. I want to see that recorded. I want to teach accurate Texas history rather than focus on the myopia of the Anglo that Sam Houston, Stephen F. Austin, and those guys were the guys that built Texas. You know, that's not true. They came in to an established Texas with the rule of law from Spain. You know, that's what exactly... It, uh, slavery was prohibited in Texas long before uh, the, the, the 1860s. Long before. And so, so I want to teach accurate Texas history. Now, as you know, I've pushed for the creation of a Department of Mexican-American Studies in, in uh, uh, University of Texas, and, and they're in the process of doing that. Uh, and I know uh, Nicole and, and uh, Domino and, and Emilio Zamora and Angela Valenzuela, and they're involved in that process. And so, yeah, I'm disappointed that we're focusing on Latina slash old Latina, Latino issues. And, and my, my objection there is I think that Latino Latino is an all-encompassing term, you know? When you look at a herd of cattle, you say, they're the cows. I tell las vacas. Now we're going to look at a herd of horses. I tell los caballos. But we, those are encompassing terms. Pues hay cinco caballos y cinco yeguas o tres yeguas or whatever, you know? Or hay quince vacas y un toro. We do not, the, the, those are encompassing terms. In the case of the vacas, is the female. In the case of the horses, is the male. Marranos? No, pues son, ahí están los marranos. No, pues son cinco marranas y dos marranos machos. And so, so we, we, the term becomes all encompassing. Latino is all encompassing. Latinos and Latinas. So when we 
make it a special thing that we put the A in parenthesis slash O, or we're saying we want to focus on the Latina, and then when, when I read, we want to talk about sexuality, social class, gender, and those kinds of things. Hey, we're diffusing this thing from the focus that I want, which is strictly the 500 years of Mexican-American Tejano history in Texas, which I think what's, it's important to Texas history. And we're going to go to the Caribbean, to the Mexico, Central America, South America, uh, Italy, Spain, France, uh, Portugal, and those are Latinos. Those are all la oh, to those are Latinos, and so we're going to focus on all that, and that means that the Mexicano Tejano doesn't get enough coverage. Pure and simple. That's how I feel about it, uh, and and uh, I will also say that I am going to support the Department of Mexican Americans. Latina, they're going to support them, but, but I wish that we could focus on mexican American. That's what's important to me. Okay. Tejanos. So let me ask you this. That monument, what do you think that monument, what effect does having that monument have on the state of Texas? Well, first of all, I think it makes a statement that we're ready to recognize the contribution of Tejanos and the important. I mean, you, you heard Governor Perry say, you know, the future of Texas is tied directly to the future of the Hispanic population. And you heard David Dewhurst talk about, you know, that since the 1500s, we had people from Spain, from Mexico, traveling to Texas, either directly through ports of entry at, at the coast in Texas or going to Mexico and then traveling on north to, to Texas. And over 500 years, the contribution of these people, their fabric has been woven into Texas culture. And that is work, family, love of country. I think there can be no argument that Tejanos loved the United States and that Tejanos has fought gallantly and won many Congressional Medal of Honor uh, awards and many bronze citations for bravery in combat. And, and we just had a recognition that many were denied a Congressional Medal of Honor because they were Mexican. And so now we're doing a little, a little correction there. And, and so there can be no doubt about love of country. So all of these values have been woven into this great state of Texas and the culture of the state, the fact that this state is committed. And so we want to recognize that, you know, and, I, and so, so that the Hano Monument make that statement. Second is that over the years, uh, a million people go through the Capitol grounds. That's what my estimates that I've been given, and I'm not sure I've never counted them. So, but, but many, many people go through the Capitol grounds, and you have all these young kids making school, school trips, and the only thing that the Hispanics saw was the Mexican hut or Santana on his knees with a sword to his neck, humiliating. You go down that hallway to the extension of the Capitol, every photo that's there has Tejanos as labor and blue-eyed blondes as engineers. That's not a reality. That's not a reality. I want to change that. You know, so I, and I, th and I think we're going we're to be on our way to do that. And I think that this Tejano Monument is, a, it is an extremely popular. I mean, I got a call from John Sneed yesterday. They put in a granite pebble area so people can take the pictures and they don't destroy the grass. You know, you know it, the grass is not going to grow here because there's so many people taking pictures of the Tejano Monument. And, and so, so I think that, that now Hispanic kids that come up, there's a sense of pride. Hey, we're Mexicanos, that, that's what we are. You know, and so I think that that has a huge impact to the future. Okay, so then the kind of the, the next step is, so how is that gonna affect those Hispanic kids with a sense of pride? How is that going to change their trajectory? Or uh, well, I, I think uh, it, it opens a lot of eyes and, and people start, you know, understanding that intellect 
is not patented by Anglo-Americans, and nothing brought it home more effectively than this young man in New York that got accepted to eight, all eight Ivy League schools. He was African-American. African-Americans are dumb. No, they're not. <laughs> Intellect is not patented by the Anglos. And so I think there's going to be an acceptance. And so you start opening doors that we're different because of our cultural backgrounds, no doubt, but that we have the same intellect you have. You know, there can be no doubt. It gets back to, you don't have the intellect to go to A&M. Hmm? I got one for top 1% in all these tests. So, so I think it'll start waking people up that give them an opportunity, educate them, and, and uh, you know, they will develop. Okay. Do you have any questions? Uh, no. Um, I think we should say that one bit at the beginning where you're like, um, yeah. you just... Yeah. Okay. Um, we're good. Is there anything... Wait, wait, before you do that. Is there anything that you would like to add? <laughs> well, I, I appreciate your coming down to the ranch and, and, and um, getting a taste of South Texas and, and getting to see how we live. And, and uh, I, I look forward to your product and... and uh, I think down the road, uh, what we did with the Benson, uh, Benson Library and uh, the Center for Latin American Studies, donating all the documents from the Tejano Monument, will down the, down the future will create a bunch of master's degrees and PhDs and Tejanos and why we do things and how we do things and so on. So I think it's a it's a very positive positive future. Okay. And let me uh, end with this. Uh, today is May the twenty fourth, uh, two thousand fourteen. We're sitting at. Um, in Zapata, Texas. My name is Maggie Rivas Rodriguez, and we just finished interviewing Renato Ramirez. And Mr. Ramirez, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's been great.